So welcome to the Zen and the Art of Free Software Talk, um, which is a catchy title to get you all in traceability. Uh, know your, your user, you are a free software developer, so you scratch your itch. So you are the user of your software, so the better you know your users, the better you know yourself, <laughs> and you reach enlightenment. Uh, I will go in the Himalaya to meditate about that sometimes, and I will start a new religion. And uh, hi, hey, uh, oh, okay, okay. So I'm going to introduce a couple of key concepts called situation and frustration, and then uh, well, which are, they are interested in, like usually, and then I will explain how to do a bit of specification design, testing, and debugging from a social point of view uh, in like 45 minutes, maybe less, maybe more, I don't know. Uh, so get ready. I've tried to take some concept from the um, ergonomics world and map them as much as they could into uh, free software development. There's a paper in my um, talks page about it as well, and well, I'll point you there later. So, software shapes society. This is an old one, it's not even funny anymore. Uh, but the kind of, well, programs you do kind of have an influence on your users because. Well, what do you allow them to do? I mean, you make, thing, you make things easier for them and you make things harder for them. So this will change the way they work. Uh, we are used to think that it's uh, mankind creating artifacts, shaping artifacts, inventing artifacts, but then the artifacts go back into mankind uh, and change mankind. So when someone invents a hammer, then we start building stuff. And we find out that sometimes nails stick out and we want to have screws. And, and so without the hammer and the nail, we wouldn't have invented screws. And now we have a need for screws we never thought about. And so we invent the screwdriver and then we start using the screwdriver to dig holes in things. And then, then like we have this whole like mutual changing which means that the program is never perfect and you can't sell it in a box. And, but then we do free software, we don't sell stuff in a box. So we are already doing things right. We should just keep this going. Okay, let's skip that. Situation in this whole um, word uh, there's like people using your software and uh, let's take like a program to read email and then you, you have a user reports a bug about your mail software and then you handle him or her like it was you sitting in your room or whatever reading email and maybe it's like uh, someone in a nuclear reactor reading email coming from I don't know, some automated checking system, or maybe it's like an 80 years old man in the middle of the Sahara Desert trying to talk to his grandson in, immigrated in France, or maybe it's whatever. So the same mail reading concept gets situated, it's called situated, into different kind of situations, which absolutely change everything involved, the meaning of it and so on. And uh, it's like thinking about runtime information for your software. When you see your like, piece of code, it's like one thing, but then like the, the, the computer it runs on, the amount of memory, the amount of disk space, and how busy is the processor, all change the way your software is run. And, may, and like this runtime sit situation makes it more or less useful, and it's the same with people. So it's a nice thing to start asking oneself questions about the situation. And then the frustration. By the way, situation, let's go back, I forgot, also changes identity. Um, I'm not, I guarantee, in real life, 
as idiot as I am in DevConf. Uh, at least in some of my real life. So, and like there's people that speak with a different voice with their girlfriend or boyfriend than they speak with other people. You, you have like, you're talking with someone like, yeah, shit, fuck, this stuff is really crap, damn, fix it. The phone rings, hi, cutie, <laughs> how are you doing? And so, even the identity of a person changes in situations and it's like negotiated by the other people around and the rules in society. This is all like when someone uses the software, the context and everything is really matters. And then you have frustration, which is uh, something everyone working with computers should learn how to cope with. Frustration is when I want to do something and I can't. And I screw up and beat people or flame Debian develop. Um, frustration usually emerges from something that has gone wrong and um, people cope with it better or worse. So we are training people to cope with it by submitting a bug report, for example, which is a constructive way of doing it. Unless the bug report is like, fuck, it doesn't work, you idiot. Which is a bad way of doing it. So um, handling frustration and like l learning how to handle one's frustration uh, could like lead you instead of like banging your head against the wall, which is like driving your frustration against yourself, could lead you to like fix the bug, send a patch or something, or like take a break in computing and do something else. And, uh, and there are ways to increase or reduce frustration of users, which we don't usually think about. We'll see one or two later. But uh, getting used to realize when we are frustrated in our computer interaction uh, makes us, opens our eyes a bit in seeing how our users can be frustrated when they report a bug, when they flame Debian Devel, or whatever. Andrew Safin is in the crowd, so we could ask him about frustration. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> Hi, Andrew, finally we meet. Uh, I'd like to talk with you a bit. Uh, okay, let's close frustration here and go like into something more useful. Uh, so we design software and we're used to do like specification and all the other kind of stuff. There's a way of doing specification from a social point of view which is defining users, uh, who you are developing for. Um, and there's one way invented by this guy uh, over here, which like it's called Cooper and uh, like was among the people who invented Visual Basic, but then he went on doing something more useful, right? Um, well, now he has a design company and sometimes writes inter interesting stuff. Well, you may have different kind of users in different kind of environments, and uh, one size doesn't fit all. And it's nice before designing a software to see who we are designing for. And this design can be done using persona, which is a detailed description of an average non-existing user. As like a person is like your average user. And the concept of average user, we most of us know, is like the one that doesn't exist. The average American, hopefully, doesn't exist. The average Italian doesn't exist. It's like some middle point among behavior of many people. And so your aver the average user of your mail application doesn't exist. But you can design one, you can like outline one uh, to have a reference point. Uh, it's very important that these descriptions don't exist uh, to avoid focusing on someone's quirks. So let's say that I uh, have to design, uh, the, for example, the Debian website. And, um, and then I, 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 I try to think who I design it for, and I think like everyone. Okay, wrong. 
everyone means no one will, if you design for everyone, then no one will find it right. So you want to design it for users, people, in, uh, Debian developers, and people in the NMQ, and press people. And then users is tricky. Leave it to the custom Debian distribution people who know who their users are, and so do the press people. So let's try to outline a persona of the press people. Let's give it a name. Uh, man or woman? Man, okay, I help man. Uh, John Doe from uh, ZDNet, whatever, like uh, 35 years old, uh, has to track like uh, 20 news sources, like reads the all the kind of GNOME announce, whatever announce mailing lists, and, and reads the Debian website uh, every day, and uh, works for like uh, six hours a day, and then he has another uh, part-time job, whatever, then you start outlining some picture like that. And that becomes the reference you use for design. And, and this picture helps you to see needs of someone who is not yourself. Um, and with free software projects, there's another nice issue, which is sometimes we are part of our users and sometimes we are not. And when we are, it's nice to see if we are like the others, if we really design for ourselves. And when we are not, it's nice to know to also outline us as one of the things involved to see, to avoid our personal frustration. For example, if I'm like a hardcore uh, assembler, like coder, and I'm writing, um, I don't know, an application for um, um, children in primary school, then like that's, that usually doesn't fit. Although if you still do assembly, maybe you have, okay, whatever. Um, so I if that is the situation, like I design for someone who's absolutely different than myself, I create something that I don't like, and I have to overcome that frustration. And so in a way, clearing out a bit before why do I do it and who do I do it for is really important to do things right and avoid to get crazy in the meantime. And so that's one, and you can find a bit of literature. I posted by accident today, before the talk, I posted a link to an article talking about Persona in the DebConf mailing list because it was, used, it was useful for the web buff. And we go to the second step. So once you know the person, the Persona you are targeting, you want to see what are their goals, what they want to do in life. And uh, there's like, Always the same Cooper guy outlined four kind of goals. The most important one is the personal goal, which is uh, sometimes hidden, like we don't want to tell people because they're a bit ashamed, but like don't feel stupid is a big personal goal. And um, when you see the error message which says like, you got the wrong name, that breaks one of your main personal goals, because you don't want to feel stupid, maybe it's a problem in the interface, but the interface blames you, and it's like going to the post office, and like the guy's an idiot, but then blames you for like not doing things right. Um, so personal goal also are, are the like, um, I'm a researcher, and I would like the computer to do most of the work, so don't focus on outlining text and don't spend ages in like making text bold of underline and uh, let the computer do all the layout is very good. Many people in science do uh, like LaTeX. While maybe if you are a secretary and you do boring typing jobs, you may like to uh, have your work fancier in having some way of putting more creativity in what you do. And so you may appreciate being able to do all sort of color and layout stuff, so at least you make your work less boring. So in that case, you don't want to get bored. These are the personal goals, which are more important than the work goals, which is actually getting things done. 
submit paper to the conference or increase the sales of the company. Uh, I like to have fun giving the talk much more than I like preparing the paper, right? Uh, so, well, th th that's the work goal, but then I have a personal goal in the top. My personal goal here is like spread some knowledge about usability to free software people who are by chance the people that create the operating system that I use. And so if they know a bit more of that, then I will have a better system. And our people like less aggressive when reporting or answering bugs. And then my work goals, well, is creating a good operating system and prepare the talk. And, um, and then there are practical goals, like when you create a paper, practical goal is typing stuff, which usually do not correspond to the personal goal. I want to, uh, well, go to the conference, drink uh, all kind of alcohol from all kind of parts of the world. I want to submit the paper, and there's a practical goal, which is type the damn paper, which is really boring, and I would really like something that gets it out of my brain and types it for myself. So personal goals is things you want to optimize really well so that people don't spend time in something compulsory but uninteresting. Um, and there are false goals. Uh, for example, in the past, not now anymore, unfortunately, in the past, like making a word processor had the false goal of using few CPU cycles. Uh, well, then people have been overcoming that a bit, and now they do all, sto all sort of background stuff like completion and spell checking that we actually like. Um, or like uh, when you design like uh, web pages, you may have the false goal of minimizing disk space, but then maybe you have you can add like 60 gigabyte hard, hard drive to the server, and it's okay. Uh, and then in mi in minimizing disk space, you you end out like having a slower website because it has to generate all the pages. So, but there are false goals that comes from uh, stereotypes in society, which is useful to recognize and like question all the people goals. We, we try to figure out to see if they're really true. And, uh, and well, when you, the, so in design, you have the persona of people, you outline, you outline their goals, you try to understand them like a bit broader to just say the goal, I'm designing a word processor, so the goal of this guy is to write a letter. That's kind of, doesn't quite see the big picture. So the goal of this guy is like, I don't know, sell something. And write a letter is a practical goal for selling something. Uh, so this is another thing to start looking uh, with, paying a bit of attention to. And then you have tasks. So when someone actually gets to do something, there's, well, the way you, you, you work to your goal are tasks. So that's, so we get to the task can be analyzed. So there's task analysis that works kind of like that. You take your persona thing, you situate it, him or her, into some kind of environment, and then take the goals and see how they go there. And you have to try to find the best way to go there that minimizes frustration. So um, one thing that I realized is many people, like am among us, uh, oh, when, when I did the survey on Debian users, if someone remember that, uh, many people perceive that, uh, so what do people use Debian for? Servers, right. What do you use Debian for? Reading email. Good, so I thought, okay, uh, you, we have people that like have like work goals of like managing servers and they're developers or system administrators. They're system administrators with the work goal of managing servers and uh, the practical goal of reading email a lot. So you wanna make email efficient for these people. And these people are subscribed to tons of mailing lists and Matt sucks at making summaries of tons of mailing lists. And so I came out and wrote a nice tool that 
makes the summary of mailing list and then you double click on a mailing list, it runs MAT. And people who see it and, actually, and who have a technical setup that fits this software are like, whoa, I so much needed it. <laughs> because like that they see where they have new mail and if they have important mail and whatever. And so you go through the steps and you usually make something that really fits that spot nicely. And that's task analysis. There's a new, another concept. Well, task analysis doesn't come from the Cooper guy, so there's no Cooper icon. And there's another soft, hmm? That's more than seven items, plus or minus four. I know. <laughs> Blame him. <laughs> so let's, um, well, that's not even groupable, but whatever. Point taken. Another, yeah, <laughs> well, it was not the one that came out with the seven plus minus two rule, yeah, so, but, uh, which is to play, explain something. Okay, uh, another interesting thing it came out with, which is worth mentioning quickly, is politeness of software. Uh, the software is like, it says that software is like your waiter in the restaurant, taking your orders and like fulfilling them, and you want the waiter to like, be interested in what you need and not bother you too much anyway and like have common sense and anticipate your needs. Like if it brings you the soup and you didn't ask for the spoon, it would be nice if he also brings <laughs> the spoon to you, even if you didn't ask. This, and software doesn't always work like that. Um, so, uh, so all this stuff, it's pretty nice to read uh, the book he wrote because has nice exp explanation for it, but then to cut it simple, uh, if you consider your software as a servant to the user, and a nice thing, nice thing is that your software could be a servant for yourself, you could code it in a way that it's quite pleasant to have that as a servant, and you don't have instead an asshole that sits there and you have to point it to every single step it needs to do. Then we get to I think one of the major forms of frustration, which is the magic number seven plus minus two. This is a small, a small schematics of how the brain works, in case you were curious and no one told you. So it's really simple. You have a mass storage with virtually unlimited capacity, or at least it hasn't been measured yet as far as I know. Also because it's, well, it contains concepts instead of like bits, so it's also hard to measure it. Uh, well, okay, that interacts with external organs, but then we skip that at the moment. And then you have the working cache, which has a limited size of seven plus minus two atomic arbitrary items. It could be seven plus minus two apples, numbers, um, CTs, whatever you can think as a unique thing, and then you do associ associative queries from the working cache to the mass storage. So when I, uh, when I have like salmon in my mind, uh, then that goes down to the mass storage and brings up memories of like uh, when I've been at the canteen today and uh, giving a talk with the salmon hanging pretty much here or it reminds me of when I was in Scotland and memories of uh, the, 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 the Scottish people being upset by the United States who were making researches showing then salmon from United States is healthier than the Scottish and then whatever like, and that's associative queries. You have an item in your uh, cache which brings, pulls up new items in the cache. The cache is limited, seven plus minus two atomic arbitrary items. It's easy to see that uh, if I start telling you a list of homogeneous things like numbers and after it gets a, a bit longer than so and so, you start forgetting about them. So if I start telling you like uh, five, three, one, two, you can repeat that to me, right? If I start telling, if I t told you like nine, one, two, three, two, four, one, nine, three, 
two, five, seven, eight, you probably can't repeat that that easily. So that's like you get in touch with the limit of your cache. And so, well, when you make a program and you click on a menu and you have a list of like 10 items without any separators on them, there's like a little bit of frustration that kicks in. Because you have a list of things, you have a simple question, what do you want to do? A list of items written down, can't be more simple. But then you have problems seeing the picture, seeing what these are, what, which, which one is the good one. You go through, you get to the last one, you forgot about the first one, you have to go up again. And overlooking this is, is, is a source of madness, which is a, and a, it's a really common source of madness. So what do you want to do since there's a nice way to, uh, to go out of this? We have two keywords, one is atomic and the other is arbitrary. So if I have like, well, I can't remember numbers as I told them before, but I can, I can remember my, o my own phone numbers. And uh, which become one single atomic item. Once I've been using them and using them and using them, they go down in the mass storage as something unique. And then I can retrieve them in only one slot. So making groups is a way of separating stuff that, that's quite fractal. I can think of my city as a single item, and then I can split it up in neighborhoods, in places, squares, trees, roads I've been walking, uh, I don't know, friends that live there. So that, that, that's all recomposed. There's many ways of associating stuff to one atomic item. And so grouping things meaningfully is really good. If you have a menu with like 20 items, but separated in like four <coughs> groups that have meanings, then that's good. Um, and so that's, well, wh when, you, when you design interfaces, you can just, by these small bits, make work simple or harder. Interfaces, command line, um, help, man pages, websites, link collections, and whatever. Who was at a DevTech talk could probably remember that my goal with DevTech is allow people to narrow down the list of packages to about seven. So that you can actually look at it, not being scared by it, and reason on it. So that's quite an, a, a very good one. You can try to spot that number in your everyday life, get used with the concept, and uh, it can be a really good defense to not feeling stupid or frustrated when you use software yourself. Because you can very well like see something and train yourself to be faster in saying, hey, they designed it badly. It's asking me crazy stuff. I mean, you can train yourself to do that before doing, damn it, this is so difficult. Uh, and you get out of the frustration. And then after, uh, well, a bit of design, some heuristic that's good to keep in mind, there are ways of testing software like social wise. There's another one who can't stay below seven, but that's uh, okay because it's a checklist. So you can go through them one by one and they are disconnected. So you don't need to have them all in mind. Um, there are uh, heuristic techniques which are fairly easy to use if you are slightly open-minded. And uh, it's like checklist of things to check when you make something. So this is the one of the most famous ones, the Nielsen's, Nielsen heuristic evaluation technique. It says that you should check that the system status is visible. System status is visible. So, well, I know if there is something wrong. And then there's a match between the system and the real world. So I can use real world metaphors and knowledge and bring them into the system. And so that makes it easier to understand. I have control and freedom. I'm not bounded by some arbitrary uh, features in the program, well, and so on. And you can go to nielsenuseit.com website and you will find an unbelievable amount of literature on it. Um, 
And if you have an interface you hate, an interface that makes you angry about using it, you go pick up the heuristic evaluation technique, the, the, the kind of smallest, uh, the, 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 a bit, the one a bit more expanded, like the Lintian dash capital I expansion of these items with the, the, the three or four lines explanation of all of them. You pick that up, you put it next to your uh, hated interface, you go through them one by one, and then you submit the best bug report of your life. It's really good. That's one nice way of doing testing. Uh, and then there's a nice way of doing social debugging. I really like this one. And um, I really, I, I want to push that in Debian. It's unbelievably easy. It's been around for a long time and we are all stupid in not using it. It's called Flanagan Critical Incident Technique. It's been invented by Mr. Flanagan, whoever. To, um, to work in the aerospace industry, mainly for military uh, aircraft, to debug when things go wrong, uh, user-wise, uh, the whole ergonomics stuff developed. Wake up, Alfie! Hi. Uh, <laughs> the whole uh, usability stuff developed in the military world uh, because they were realizing that it was not only engines going wrong and, and so they starting, well, trying to see how to make things more efficient with people as well. And this Flanagan came out with four, uh, four simple questions, that's less than seven, it's really easy to use, um, to ask people when something goes very wrong or very right. Um, Describe what led up to the situation. What did you do that was effective or ineffective? What was the outcome of the action? And was, was it effective or would have been, uh, or there was something better that could have been done or expected? Yeah, thanks for the, um, Martin said he's seen it before and there's one missing question that could be added which is what did you want to do? Which, well, fits in because there are four so you can put a fifth one. <laughs> if there were seven, it's like no. <laughs> um, so th that's nice to add. Um, well, if people report a bug to you, Maybe like usability bug, or uh, well, like I can't do this, and you're like, I can, so you are an idiot. Uh, well, before that, try to ask, so to go through like these four questions, and, um, and maybe something interesting comes out. So, well, um, luckily you can find this on the slides online and on the paper, so I really suggest you try in the like obscure bug reports you get, you try asking these questions and they bring in a, a bit more insight. Remember the fifth mad duck question, which is what did you want to do? So, well, to finish, I've been quick, uh, strange. <laughs> um, Many free software projects don't seem to have a direction. Like, well, I just develop stuff because I want to try out things or because I want to copy something that exists or because, well, that, that thing written in Perl is doing it right and I want to do it in Python or something like that. But there's no, well, they're not really well thought as to solve a need. And, uh, well, there are ways to actually think and engineer software in a way that can actually have a chance to solve some need. And some of them are quite easy to pick up. It's just like spend a little bit before uh, writing the code, spend a little bit thinking about what do you want to do, for whom. And like if you want to learn about OKMail OK programming, and so you want to write an email client in OKMail, OK that's perfectly right. And But if you first think about like, identify one 
one target, one kind of target users to create that email client, it's even better because you won't only have learned about OCaml, but you will have produced something useful. And um, many free software projects don't care about their users, which is an unbelievable source of frustration for the users and for the developers, because then you have users you don't care about and they report you bugs and they give you, give you a contribution you don't care about and you tend to think that all users are stupid and, and then you solve them and then they will say all developers are stupid and that's a nice escalation that ends up, well, I don't know, famous, whatever. But there are ways of working with users. You, can, you are allowed to tell users like, okay, well, okay, you, you, you do physics, well, I'm designing like for high school teachers and I don't want to put that feature in because that's something that would screw their life. I'm sorry, maybe you want to use that other software. Or, uh, or maybe you want to fork your software and make one version for one and one version for the other or change it by configuration, whatever. But when you like get used in thinking about kinds of users and user needs, you start having the brain structure to actually solve these issues. And then, lastly, if you learn how to make your users happy, uh, you could be among your users and you could actually become happier. Uh, you are a user even if you develop the software because, well, that, that's part of your workflow, of your goals, of your work, and so you want to make that efficient as well. Uh, so you want to apply all this also to your personal process so that you don't end up like locked in some weird situation, at some point you screw up, tell everyone to fuck off, and everything dies. And so, be happy. That's the way. Thank me for that, because then from now on your life will be all shiny. <laughs> Do we have any questions? You have a few more minutes if you want to. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Two questions. Okay. Three questions. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, the suggestion was to put reference uh, uh, li on the mailing list about these things, yes, I'll do it. This is actually more of a question to the audience. Um, I would like to know how many people actually are experienced with this sort of uh, software design. How many of you use some kind of user research or other things to design your software before you write it? Not, not that many. Thank you. In the beginning of your talk, Enrico, you talked about um, users and that, in a sense, users want to get something done and they don't necessarily care about how things are done and then one of the things you said, don't spend too much time in UI design, like making things bold and, and underline and, and stuff like that. Um, you, I, I hope you're aware that projects like the KDE project actually do nothing else. They, they really worry about how things look like and in the end it's very important to the casual user to have an intuitive interface because we all, we're, we're sitting here, we can you know deal with GTK applications. I don't think the regular user really wants to to interact with those because it's just not intuitive, nor pretty, nor um, do you really want to spend time on it. I, this is a personal opinion, you can flame me afterwards, but I just wanted to say that I think it's important that you distinguish between um, users that actually want, want to get things done and they are willing to t make compromises and users that have to do things on a computer. And for those, I think it's more important to actually Yes. Um, design your UIs perfectly. Yes, it's also nice to design the UI nicely. Uh, there's a whole science of, um, uh, well, those guys with the camera 
like tracking you, like eye tracking when you use the software to like find the best spot to put a button and all that sort of things. Uh, they're really good, but they come after doing a nice study on the goals. Um, because if you have at the wrong dialog box and you make it really pretty, you do one thing that Cooper, Cooper calls um, embellishing the corpse, decorating the corpse. Maybe that dialog box shouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, so, well, for example, when I was designing uh, those, um, the, my Buffy uh, like um, thing for summarizing uh, mailboxes, well, I, the option was, should I spend like one day making a really nice dialog box for adding all your mailboxes one by one? Well, I went for automatically detecting the list of mailboxes that you have and not putting the dialog box, which makes me really more, much more happy when I run the software, I have new mail in a new mailbox and that shows up automatically. So in that case, if I had had like a really nice dialog for adding dialog boxes, for adding uh, mail folders, well, that, that shouldn't have been there, no matter how nice. But then when you have the good interface, decoration, I mean, like tidying up is Ubuntu, I think, in a way, like you take a perfectly working Debian and you make it like, yeah, but, uh, and then, whatever, and you make it like n nice to a specific group of user and whatever, well, that kind of tidying up is really important because it also improves the efficiency. If you outline the right word, I find it easier. If you separate stuff with a nice border, uh, it also split them into items. And so I get less scared about the complexity of the interface. So it's those small cues that are really important. But first, well, you have to get the right tasks. There was a question up there? Yeah, I, I, wa I was going to comment. Uh, I think you said almost all everything I would. Uh, KDE and GNOME's uh, uh, usability guidelines are more in a way of, uh, of saying the, applica the application should be consistent with a, the, with a desktop because that, that improves uh, your efficiency uh, also because you can take, take something for, uh, some things for granted. Uh, that you can you you don't have to guess the behavior of the application because you're already used to it on the the whole system. So it's not really about uh, making things beautiful only. Uh, I think it's important. By but I agree with you that uh, the rest of the application is comes first. Well, yeah. In a way, consistency with the desktop is about not providing yet another stuff that has to fit in your cache. If they all look the same, then you only have one item to cope with. If they have like different aspects, then you always have like things split in two, which kind of, again, bothers you. There's, there's a difference, which maybe has a meaning and distracts you, occupies one of these stuff, uh, one of these slots, when, and like doesn't allow you to instead pull up something interesting in that open slot from your mass storage. The more free slots you have, the more you can use your memory. When you are overworked, by the way, like your cache is always over full. I mean, the capacity could be higher, but it gives you headache. You tend to burn out. It has like psychological breakdowns when, when that's overloaded. And, and like w w when you use it too much, you have problems using your past experiences. You're losing creativity. If you do two things at the time, well, the problem is exactly that this gets full. And while well, if you do one thing at a time, focused, well, you can actually have more workspace. If there's no more question, thank you for attending. And thank you.